The study here for this morning, we'll look at uh, the first half of uh, James, uh, verse 1 through 12, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, uh, and I put a title on this morning's message, The Reckoning. Boy, that just sounds so ominous, The Reckoning. Well, the chapter really kind of starts out ominous, uh, but what do we know so far? Well, as, as we have learned over these course of months, that when it comes to the epistle or to the book of James, that James that he has taught us about practical Christian living at the crossroads of culture. And man, while that is the core of his message, you can't give a better message, uh, or you can't provide a better book, if you will, than for the times that we're living through right now. Because it's always the pressure of the panic that sets in that can cause us as Christians to get speed wobbles, that can cause us to move to a place to where we, where, where we maybe we, we, we shell back on our intensity of walking with the Lord. Maybe it's because we've tripped and we stumbled. Whatever the case may be, James is one of those books that, you know, it's like, uh, it's like the guitar that we have over here on the stage. And, you know, they, they, they tune the guitar, right, to make sure that the strings are in the right place and all that stuff. James is a book that just tunes us up. Because what James lays out and he shares, he says, hey, you call yourself a Christian, you say that you're a follower of Christ, prove it. Oh, don't do that, James. Why did you do that? But that's where James went. And we've seen that in chapter three as he, as he really drilled down on that concept of prove it. He literally said that, prove it. Wow. That stuff, is, is, that stuff that, that, that just hits our heart, man. It's like, okay, Lord. Okay, I'm gonna look into your perfect law of liberty. Lord, I wanna see where I'm at with you. And it's so beautiful as to what God does as he reveals things maybe that's off course in our lives. And it's his goodness that brings us back. But God does want us to know a few things. And I want to call for a little Bible Olympics before we actually explore James. I, I, I want to set up our time here today this way. I want, I'd like to ask that you would flip to the Old Testament book of Hosea. If you can't find it in a, in a relatively quick capacity, they will also throw it on the screen in the New King James Version. But Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, perhaps some of you have uh, memorized this verse. Perhaps some of you know this verse. I'm not going to exegete the book, the chapter, or anything. I'm just going to give a statement here on this. But as we come to Hosea 4 and 6, New King James Version, this is dealing with, with Israel's willful ignorance of God. They were willingly pushing off of God. They were willingly disregarding God. And, 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 and here's what the Lord communicates. He says that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And he goes on. He says, because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. It's a very ominous chapter here, okay? Very tough. Yes, 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 yes. But I want you to hear the concept. I want you to understand something very simply here that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. That God's people are destroyed for being ignorant or unaware. Literally, that's what the Hebrew means in this. For being ignorant and unaware. Now, the, the, the media team is going to flash up here Hosea 4 and 6 in the New Living Translation. And I want you just to look at the very beginning of this. Here it is. It says, my people are being destroyed because they do not know me. That one right there. So, so God takes this in a real personal capacity here, and I want you to, to, I want you to be able to, to just grasp mentally. And maybe you hang on to it with your hands too. I don't know. Uh, but, but understanding that, that God doesn't want us to be ignorant or unaware of who he is because he desires that relationship with you and I. And the things in which he speaks to us back in the epistle of James now, flip back over to James, the things that he speaks to us there, these things are important. These things are necessary. These things at times are very uncomfortable. These things, maybe even the text that we'll go through here today, that it starts out in such a way where it's like, oh, pastor, is that really the message that we need right now a few weeks before Christmas? Well, the answer is, well, Yeah. It's part of our Bible study. It's part of God's counsel to us. And God wants that relationship. And what better time to speak about the things that we're going to go into here right now than at the time where Christmas is upon us. And many times we get so self-absorbed and so wrapped up in self, especially during this time of the pandemic. I'm trying to lift myself out of this, this depression or the mental slug. And so what better way to do that? I'm just going to focus upon myself. Hmm. 
Well, what does James have to say about that? Well, he gives us a lot of things. But here's what our text says, James chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. He says, look here, you rich people. Well, what a joyful start to the text. Oh, look here, you rich people. <laughs> you slimy dog, what are you doing? <laughs> he, says, he says, weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. Your wealth is rotting away and your fine clothes are moth-eaten rags. Your gold and your silver have become worthless. The very wealth you were counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. This treasure you have accumulated will stand as evidence against you on the day of judgment. For listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated of their pay. The wages you held back cry out against you. The cries of those who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of heaven's armies. You have spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. You have fattened yourselves for the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed innocent people who do not resist you. And then he transitions. Dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait on the Lord's return. Consider the farmer who patiently waited for the rains in the fall and the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. Don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. For examples of patient in suffering, dear brothers and sisters, look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end. For the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. But most of all, brothers and sisters, never take an oath by heaven or earth or anything else. Just say a simple yes or no so that you will not sin and be condemned. Oh my goodness. Cancel Christmas, folks. What do we have here? In the flow of this opening portion of the track, this chapter, we go through like three different things. Now, we should know that at least just from the onset that this is a continuation. Chapter 5, these first entry verses here, is a continuation of, of really the, the heavy thing that he got onto in chapter 4, verse number 13. That it, he started opening up this emotional, tongue-lashing, rebuke, you know, pushback. He just started going for it, okay? And so we've already studied the, 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 the previous verses about the self-confidence and all of that of what James was pushing back on. But now as we roll here into this particular portion, you know, these 12 verses, what can we quickly understand? I just want to give you the, what you can quickly take away from these 12 verses. Two things. A, is James rebukes the rich for the love of money. Okay, he rebukes the rich for the love of money, verses 1 through 6. We can quickly understand that. The second thing that we can quickly understand is that James helps the church move forward, verses 7 to 12. So two quick little things. If you get nothing else out because I put you to sleep by the time the end of the message comes or something, listen, right up front you can capture two things, okay? Now, as we consider these two things, here's a number of ways that we can think about that. Okay, idea number one is this, don't be a fool. Verses one down through six, this first opening rebuke that's happening here. So James is in that place. Again, he's rebuking rich people. And what is he rebuking them for? He's, he's rebuking them for what they did to the lower class, for, for, for how they robbed the lower class through fraud. And there's a very powerful pronouncement of the coming doom that he, he says to them. He says, look here, you rich, weep and groan with anguish. And so the, the, the flavor of these words that he's using, they're heated, man. They're emotional. They're passionate. And James is going for it. Uh, I see some taking off coats. So if we need to drop that uh, temperature down, feel free to do that. I would be in support of that up here because I'm sweating. feel like a penguin in the desert up here. I'm all dressed up with my deal, but... It's hot. So, you know what it is? It's we're just so close to the Lord. We feel the fire, baby. <laughs> it's a body heat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so, so, again, he's, he's, he's pronouncing this coming doom. Now, uh, take a look at verse number one one more time here. Okay, let me get back on track. Um, again, he, he opens it up and he gets down. He says, groan. And here's the word right here. Okay, in the NLT that we just read, he says, anguish. Okay, in the, uh, in the, in the New King James Version, he uses the word miseries. 
the same Greek word, okay? This particular word right here, it's a compound word. It's, it's a word that's made up of two other words and stuck together, okay? So a compound word. And in this particular compound word for anguish, it, 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 it carries the idea, it carries the flavor is that there's, there's something that is being undergone, okay? So, so to undergo, just think about this. So it's, just, it's just like stringing together. Like these festoon lights, they're just kind of strung together, right there, okay? So, so think about the linking aspect. So to undergo in a linking capacity and the second side of this word speaks about being callous. It speaks about being hardened like concrete. So over the course of time, that is decisions were made, decisions are the linking things that create the callous and the hardness of the concrete. Now, you and I can understand that conceptually because we remember going through the, the Old Testament. We remember studying the Exodus. Uh, maybe you remember reading it. Maybe you weren't with us when we studied through this stuff. But you remember that, that Moses came before Pharaoh, and as he was before Pharaoh, there were certain things that he was saying. God says this. God says that. God says, let my people go. God says. God says. And, 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 and you would find that Pharaoh, he would say yes, and then he would say no. There was a vacillating back and forth until finally he just put his foot down. He says, get out of here. We can't handle the plagues no more. And then even that decision changed, and he went after Moses. But, but God made his heart hard and firm over those linking decisions. And what James is sharing us with us here, he says, Again, is he speaking to the rich people, the rich people that have and went to that place to where, where it's the love of money, and that love of money has corrupted them to where they're cheating the lower class by fraud. The, the society and the culture of the state, the country that we live in here right now, there is a, there's still a middle class for right now, but in, in the days of antiquity, you would have the, the wealthy class and then the poor class. There wasn't the linking in between that is there. And so this, this uh, virtually, I would suspect everybody here in this room is probably middle class. And, and the comforts and the creature comforts and the way of life that we have in the middle class, is, it's a beautiful thing. But that's not, what the, that's not what you see within the scriptures. There is the, the rich that are well taken care of. And then there are those poor people that are, that are trying to get through the day and they need every penny, so to speak, to survive on. And now James is addressing these folks What's the point in the starting of this? What is the point? Is what started off as an interest in making money turned into the love of money. And it brought all kinds of injustices. It brought all the corruption. Look to the person next to you in your aisle. Now look back to yourself. And then put your hands like this. Look at your hands. This same thing is a call for all of us as Christians to examine ourselves, Because while we might start out in this vein of just trying to be a good steward and trying to earn a living and to, to go forward and all that, if we are not careful, if our hearts are not guarded, if our hearts are not surrendered to the Lord, it can quickly turn into the place of the love of money. And those, those linking decisions over the course of time can turn and make our hearts calloused and as hard like concrete. Now, I, have, I, I, I just want to let you know that I'm just giving some applications here so that we can understand this. Because when James wrote this, it was first century Christianity. It wasn't 2020. It's not the day and age in which you and I live within. And, 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 and yet in the middle of all of this, the principle of his message, it's completely timeless. And that is, is that the, the surrendering of our heart often comes, or, or, or perhaps I should say is, is a great reflection of well, have I surrendered my treasures as well? And Jesus said that where your treasure is there, your heart will be also, right? Isn't that what Jesus said? Yeah, he did say that. Oh, goodness gracious, you guys think I'm going to a tithe message. I'm not, so relax. Take it easy a little bit. Don't get all uptight in your, I see some of your faces going like this. Pastor's trying to get more money for the end of the year. You smoking crack? It's not my money. <laughs> Gee whiz. Hear the application though, because it is all around the love of money. And he speaks very pointedly about this. Now, I want you to follow with me. I want you to go to, the, um, to 1 Timothy. So we're going to go back up to your left a little bit. 1 Timothy chapter 6. <clears throat> I, I, I want to make sure that you're capturing the heartbeat of God and not some twisted something or another from man. Okay? Um, as, 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 as Paul taught in what we call the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. As Paul was laying out to his young protege, as, as Paul was laying out as to what transfers here to you and I in 2020 as the church, 
in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 17 through 19. Uh, they'll also have it on the screen if you, if, you can't, if you can't get there fast enough. But Paul says this, pay attention. He says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasures as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. Timothy, guard what God has entrusted to you. So Paul's speaking for the Lord, and he's telling young Timothy, he says, you've got to instruct, instruct people with money. You've got to talk about it. You know, that's an open door to talk about money within the church, right there. And while the aim of this message here is not to get into this aspect of, of tithing and, and, and uh, you know, the, the part that you play in supporting the local work, I will tell you this, that even though I'm not going to talk about those things per se, I know that just the very touching on the topic because there are so many walls within our life, so many stigmatisms that we have, so many disgusting practices that are there that are linking from the decisions and, 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 and the thoughts that we've had and the practices that we've done over the course of time, that rather than being joyfully excited when it comes to this particular topic, we often push back and re repel. It'd be interesting to see what the online viewership is going right now as to once they heard this portion of scripture as to whether we're getting more viewers in this real life type context or if the viewers are falling off. Oh. Very telling of, uh, about our culture. It's very telling about the time of what James wrote. It's very telling about the day and age which you and I live in right now. Well, pastor, don't you understand? I've got these obligations and that obligation. Sure, I do. But Paul told Timothy to teach them this. So, so look one more time to verse number 17 or, or take a look at the points on the screen perhaps. He said to teach them this, don't be proud. Don't be a self-made man where you think that you don't need anybody's help. If, if, if you're rich, I need you to do something. Look to your neighbor and say you're rich. You did that with a little bit of trepidation, okay? So look to me and say you're rich. Oh, you did that a little bit better. It's kind of weird to look in the eyeballs of your neighbor there. <coughs> As Americans, even the, even the one that earns the least in this particular fellowship, by worldly standards, you are amazingly rich. Newsflash, this text is for you. This is not for somebody else flying in an airplane from California to Washington or from New York to Washington or any other place to Washington, okay? This is for you, for you. And what the instruction is, is to the rich is that Paul says, is he says, teach them not to be proud. And he, he says, teach them not to trust in their money because it's a false defense. And what, what, why, why Paul is giving this, we know that it's by the Spirit of God for the purposes of God. God doesn't want you and I to be disillusioned. God doesn't want you and I to build up our lives upon a foundation that is going to burn. God doesn't want you or I to be the individual that shows up into heaven charred and smoke burned and you're over there in the corner and you only got a Speedo on because everything else got burned up because nothing was laid ahead. Nothing was given ahead. It's a very strange picture. And he says to teach them these things. He also says, tell them, in verse number 18. Again, you guys saw it. We read it here together. But he says, tell them. Tell them to use their money to do good. Listen, it's a gift from God, so use it for God. Did you, did you get that? It's a gift from God, so use it for God. Whatever you have been given, it's a gift from God. And what God requires of you is nothing more than being, is to be an honest steward. Be a good steward over what he's given to you. And, and you know, if you're a good steward over what he's given to you, maybe he'll give you more. But often the, the, the problem becomes is, well, I don't have enough to get what I got. No, 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 you have more than enough. 
You have more than enough. You haven't been faithful, which is why things are, are strung out, which is why the, you, you, you struggle to make the pennies connect at the end of the month, which is why you come up short dollars and cents when it comes to this or it comes to that. It's because you have been unfaithful before God. Because God has promised to supply all of your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Because God has told us that there is enough, he has given enough grace for every good work. The problem comes is, is that we, we have become rich and fat in this country and especially during the course of the pandemic that we've gotten out of the regular routines that we live within, maybe job has changed, maybe, our, our, maybe, maybe there's a fear factor that is there that is holding us back, that's a whole different conversation. But all of these things are things that are in place. In, 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 ah, I got a great note in my Bible. I just thought about this. Listen, I, I wrote it right here. Okay, check this out. Can you hold it? No, I'm just kidding. I'm trying to get it out. You get older, you push your glasses out farther. It's like, what in the world? Or push your reading material out farther. Listen, reasons that we suffer, why? Is because God teaches us to trust him. Reasons for delay is because God is teaching us to submit to him. I mean, those are two important truths that we find through the course of the scripture. And God is working in your life. He's doing something amazing in your life. He's doing something amazing in my life. But Paul said that as it pertains to the rich, that, that they've got to be taught, and you have to tell them this. Tell them to be generous to the needy. You know, you know we might just brush by that. Well, why did God put that there? I don't need somebody to tell me. I've been hearing that all my whole life. Well, you need to be told again and again and again. And maybe one of the times it will capture your attention. It's like, you know, it's like, it's, it's like, <laughs> it's like teaching your kids or saying something to your kids. Hey, pick up your room. It looks terrible. Okay, Dad. And they keep going. And, and then Mom says something. Hey, clean up your mess. You know, you just left your cereal all over the counter. Clean up after. Okay, Mom. And you say it every morning. They just keep doing the same old thing. Well, listen, you might get frustrated with your kids, but think about how God feels about you and I. <laughs> Tell them to be generous. Okay, so there it is. I'm telling you, be generous. All right, let me show you the concept a little bit farther and a little bit different level, okay? Um, if you can, turn with me, Jeremiah chapter 9. Uh, I don't know if they're going to have this on the screen. They may, may not, I don't know. Uh, Old Testament, uh, so the middle of your Bible, about Psalm 118, and then just hang a right. Go over, you know, 100 or 200 pages or so uh, to Jeremiah chapter 9. Uh, it's a book that we have studied from here often and frequently through the course of this pandemic. But in Jeremiah chapter 9, all the way down in verse 23 and 24, here is what is written. It says, thus says the Lord. So God is speaking, okay? He says, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this that he understands and he knows me, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. So God is saying, he's, he's you know, again, as we're taking a little bit of a deeper look, you know, maybe the topic goes um, deeper, but it also spreads out as well. He says, he's, he brings this thing, he says, don't glory in wisdom. He, God doesn't want us to be to this place to where we have this self-satisfaction about our accomplishments and our abilities. Did you catch that? God doesn't want us to reside. He doesn't want us to have this self-satisfaction to where I glory in my achievements and my abilities. Now, I have to tell you, when I read things like this over the course of the years, that has rubbed me wrong in different times. Why? Well, because when I graduated from the police academy when I was 21 years old, that was a great accomplishment. Or when I graduated from college, or when I got my real estate uh, uh, license and all of that stuff, you know, those are great accomplishments. And, and, and you know what? <laughs> in those particular seasons of time, I have been that knuckleheaded guy. Well, I've gloried in those accomplishments. Well, this is good. Yeah, this is great. And all of that is called vain glory. It just kind of disappears and goes away. God doesn't want us to glory in that self-satisfaction of, of those things. He doesn't want us to be the person that's, to have this self-satisfaction in our strength and in our health. You know, uh, you know uh, the Bible declares to us, it's, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. That's written to you and I. It, it, it's a work of his hand and not your ability or inability. 
So what does that do? What does that mean? It means that God uses everyday, ordinary, surrendered people that are willing to show up, watch, you did it at the beginning of service, with empty hands. Are you willing to come to the Lord with empty hands and allow him to do the work in your life and through your life? This is the call. It's not glorying in what we've done. And oh yeah, the rich man, that that guy is not to have this self-satisfaction about the wealth. Why? Because what does wealth do? Am I thing cut out? Oh, it's back on. I can hear it in my ear. Okay, there it is. Uh, not that I have a piece in my ear. I can just hear the thing. The rich man, the wealth. Wealth is a wall. It's like a security blanket. It's like it's an insulation that protects me from all the stuff that's going on around me. Oh, yeah, I, I, I hear that all these things are happening here in this pandemic, and people are losing their job. But I've got enough over here. And, 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 and it's, it's like I, I put this wall up. It's like I'm insulated from the suffering of others, that, that I can stand back, and I, I cannot be involved in that. Listen, to the rich, oh, yeah, again, once again, everybody here, be generous to the needy. Help out. Now, as we view this through the vein of the New Testament, okay, I, I, I don't want us to get too serious on this. I want us to be serious so that we can understand it, but I don't want us to get so serious that we move to the place to where you feel like this. Watch. He just beat me up with the Bible. I don't want you to go there. That, 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 that's, 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 that's not the focus of what God wants. But follow me so that you can capture the heartbeat from a, a, a New Testament concept. First John Chapter 2. They may also put this on the screen as well. It's just right before the book of Revelation. Okay? 1 John, chapter 2. Verse 15 and 16, it says this. John is writing. He says, do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world... You do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. Take note. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. James is teaching about Christianity at the crossroads of culture. And as that message comes from a first century context, the days of antiquity, and falls right in here to a modern era of 2020, his message is just as powerful because the core of what he speaks about is the corruption of a man's heart. Mankind, men and women. You get that the corruption of man's heart. And that corruption is there. And what so often starts out is, is that I'm going to make a living for my family to provide these particular things turns into I've got to get a bigger house. I need to have better vacations. We need to take more vacations. I need to take on more hobbies. I need to do, I need to do, I need to acquire, I need to accomplish, I need to do. And we're skipping through this world just capturing up these particular things. James is saying in chapter 5, he says, come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Why? What are these miseries? Listen, your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eating. Your gold and your silver are corroded. Uh, skipping on down, he says that you have heaped up treasures in the last days. And, and, and then he, goes, he starts to move into the fraud, the fraud side of this thing. Do you know this? Can, can I just say this? I wasn't going to say this, but, but, but it's, it's, it's flashing on my, my mind right now, so I'm going to say it. Uh, uh, do you know that Malachi talks about robbing God? The context of this, what we're reading in, and that's where we're going to stay, we're going to stay in this vein, is, is, is about the rich having more than enough, but they're defrauding others. As it pertains to the Christian, as it pertains to the body of Christ, as it pertains to the church, in, in, in any time, in any age is that our surrender needs to be to the Lord. It's a heart surrender. And if the heart is not surrendered, that's dealing with right, the emotions and the mind together, right? Because re repentance, it's a metanoia, it's a changing of the mind that, that, that goes down into us and it changes the way I feel about it and then it changes the way that my feet go. 
It's repentance, metanoia. But so often the struggle that is, that is in the middle of this about the, 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 the conversation and the talk of, of riches and wealth and money and these particular things, the reason that it becomes so vile to swallow down is because my heart is really not surrendered to the Lord. And that's the first part that we need to do. We need to get the heart issues right. And so what James is teaching is he's putting up in these first several verses here, it's a very strong defense, it's a very powerful rebuke. He's saying, folks, don't let your heart go there. And if you are rich and you are doing this thing and you are defrauding and this is all that's happening, he says, listen, you gotta do something different because that, you're only stacking up judgment against yourself. Jesus made the point in the parable in Luke chapter 20, verses 21, or 20 to 21. You can take a look at the screen. Uh, actually, I'm gonna take a look at the screen too. It's a beautiful screen. I love that screen. God doesn't have that verse for you this morning. Well, God has showed up. He's seldom early, but never late. <laughs> You're, yeah, okay. God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything that you work for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Gang, that's the focus. That's the point. Don't be beat up from the feet up. If, 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 if maybe this has struck you in a capacity that is, you know, you feel like you've been backed into a corner. Well, I got to do this or else. No, 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 listen. Listen, the whole thing is about a relationship with Jesus. The whole thing is. It doesn't, re it doesn't remove responsibility on your side. It doesn't do any of that. You have a responsibility. But please understand that it is impossible for you to do the work of the Spirit in the strength of the flesh. And thus, the need for having a surrendered heart to the Lord by way of that relationship is first. Final lesson here for all believers in this particular category, and we're moving on after this. Here's the lesson. That James is doing a great job of being very emphatic about this but you and I should know that the misuse of riches, it erodes our character. And that's the core of his message. He was saying, you call yourself a Christian, you call yourself a believer, he says, prove it. Let your character give testimony that the words that you're saying out of your mouth are actually in fact true. Warren Wiersbe, he says this. He says, God will not judge our sins because they have been already been judged on the cross, but he will judge our works. That's our personal ministry. And all of this, if you'd like the reference, we're not going to look at it today, but all of this is seen very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 through 15. You can examine it on yourself, that Paul, he goes and he talks about silver and gold and wood and hay and straw, two different categories, gold, silver, and precious stones. Those are the eternal things. The wood, hay, and straw, those are the temporal things. He says that each person's ministry, their work, their life is going to be evaluated. And the evaluation is, is, does it stand the test of fire? These rich folks that we're talking about, you and I as well, because we're rich, we could at least take lessons from this, is that as our lives are, are, are tested, the stewardship of our lives is tested. Remember, the, the judgment for our sins has already been taken by Jesus. Okay? We're not going to stand before the great white throne judgment, which is those whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's, those are the people that are not saved. If you're saved, okay, it's not a, we got a high-ranking Christian and a low-ranking low, low Christian. No, 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 no. Is your name in Jesus' book or not? Have you accepted the free gift of his offer or not? It's not a performance-based thing. It's what you've done with the cross. What, we, what have you done with the offer of salvation? That's the only thing. Your name is either in his book or it's not. But these are lessons that we can learn from, that we can grow by. Okay, let's pivot. Let's move on to the second thing so we can begin to wrap this thing down. Okay, idea number two. It takes 10,000 times more upbeat on the idea number two, okay? Keys to move forward, verses 7 to 12. Uh, again, we've already, we've already read this, so I don't think I need to go back and read it in, in, in detail. But I would just say this about that. Is that, that this, this transition, notice he, he, he becomes so 
family like this. Dear brothers and sisters. Okay, so that hot tone that was being rolled out, chapter four, verse 13 to the end of the chapter, chapter five, all the way down, one through verse number six or so, a very hot tone. The tone changes. And he gives these keys to move forward. He pivots here at, at verse number seven. And, and, and here's what he's gonna provide for us. He's gonna give us three valuable insights for you and I to move forward in the faith. Okay, I'll just lay them out. I'll give them to you at a high level. First one is this. He's gonna give us faith guidance. Second one will be dangers to avoid. And the third, and these will be randomly on and off the screen. The third is, is, is examples for encouragement, okay? So let's unfold these one by one. At verse number seven, um, maybe I will read it. He says, dear brothers and sisters, he says, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmer who patiently waits for the rain in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. So the faith guidance, what is he saying here? He says, wait for the Lord's return. So he is putting a focus on the finish, okay? This is, this is, this is a key for you and I to move forward. That as he pours into us, that, that as James writes this for the church, he's giving us guidance as to how to walk out the faith. And what he says is, hey, focus on the finish. Realize that Jesus is coming back. That when you get into every day, every situation, every relationship, whatever, realize that Jesus is coming back. So live your life with that on the forefront of your mind. Live your life with that as the core of the emotion. Hey man, I wanna be pleasing to the Lord. The other thing that he says right there in seven, the second half of verse number seven, is, is that he's, he starts dealing with the farmer. This is the side of exercising patient, okay? Uh, this is the side that perhaps you're like me. You're always having to go through the trials to deal with patients. Come on already, you know, I'm driving to church here this morning, my lovely bride next to me in her fancy new sweater. We're sitting there driving to church, and, she's, and before we left the house, she said, oh, it's going to be such a breeze to get to church this morning because it snowed and nobody will be out. It's too cold and all this stuff. I looked at her. Woman, you're driving with me. This is going to take us an hour now. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, so much to say. <laughs> so little time to say it in. So we get to a light. The light turned red. I look to the right. I look to the left. I look across the intersection. There is no stinking buddy around but I got to sit for a minute at a red light. I felt like being a sinner and running that light. <laughs> God's teaching me patience, okay? He's teaching you patience too. You got to deal with this. <laughs> oh boy. So be patient. Like the farmer who waits for the early rain and the latter rain, okay? The fall rain, the spring rain and all that before that crop comes to bloom. Uh, verse number eight, you know, this, this moves on down to the place of taking courage. And this is something that, we, that, uh, uh, that, that all of us can benefit from as well. Take courage for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Listen, so many times when we lack courage, we get into this place to where we feel trapped, to where we feel, we, we feel like, oh, man, all the motivation is gone, all the strength to move, and everything is gone. But, but he says take courage. And, and that courage is nothing more than getting strength in the face of difficulty. That's all it is. That's what courage is. It, 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 it's, it's getting strength in the face of difficulty. Now, who gives you the strength? It's the Lord that gives you the strength. Isaiah tells us that those that, that, that wait upon him are going to mount up with wings like eagles. Uh, the concept is nothing more than that, that we get fresh strength. That as we go and, and we wait upon the Lord, we spend time in the presence of the Lord, we have that relationship with the Lord that God gives us that fresh strength. He gives us a fresh perspective. He gives us the courage to, to be able to combat the hour that we're in. So those are the faith guidances that he gives. Um, that the, the, the next key to moving forward is the dangers to avoid, okay? Down in verse number nine, he calls it out. He says, don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. So this grumbling side, maybe I could ask you guys a question. Well, how does that happen? Uh, how is it that we fall into this place of grumbling? You know, think about everything that we've already come through here already and, and what he's trying to do with this, this new portion of encouragement, Think about it. When you're disappointed or I'm disappointed, what's the first thing that we do? We don't get prayed, oh, Lord, thank you for this trial that you've put me in. No, we go, blast it. Why is this happening? You know, we start crying like a bunch of babies, even though we're 50 years old. I mean, and he says, don't grumble about other people. And when the disappointments come, you and I, we can recognize this as a danger to avoid. We can recognize our weakness in this area. We can recognize when we're not in the area. 
We, can, we, we know that the overflowing of disappointment, it leads to that place of frustration. And when the frustration reaches a certain thing, and then it gets released to those that are closest to us. God doesn't want us to go that way. What God wants us to do is to be able to recognize the condition. This is a danger to avoid. Don't grumble. Don't take your disappointment and start spilling it out about other people. They did this or they didn't do that. Don't do that. He says, rather release this to me. Roll this off onto me and I'll take it. I'll take that so that you don't overflow with all this hot wrath, so that you don't go to this place to where your relationship is strained. And, and wow, that's super important. Man, I can get that. Now, what does he also tell us here in verse number nine? Well, he, he says that the judge is standing at the door. Well, listen, if there's a motivation for something, maybe it's God's watching, so break the habit. Did, did you get that? God's standing at the door. What is the motivation? Oh, God's watching. I need to break this habit. Let's be done with this. And he moves on. Okay, the third and the, the, the final key here is this, is examples for encouragement. Now, as he moves through uh, verse 10 and 11, so just two verses there, he starts pointing back here to others in the faith that have suffered. Okay, and he calls out the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. You know, one guy that I always love to, to bring to remembrance is Jeremiah. The Jeremiah is a guy that, I don't know, I think it was like 40 plus years that he, he served the Lord. He ministered for the Lord. And in his ministry for the Lord, it was a completely unfruitful ministry. And many times, Jeremiah found himself getting the short end of the stick. Even the people within the faith community during his time, they would ridicule him. We know that he was thrown down into a, a well or to a dungeon, and, and the, the scriptures speak about he's in that, that miry clay and that he was starving to death, you know, until finally they lifted him out of the pit and all these things. The, the, the Jeremiah is a guy where his country went into captivity halfway through his ministry. And yet he was still called to, in the middle of all that suffering, he was still called to be a witness. To, 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 to give words of encouragement. And, and man, we've studied here in more recent days, we've studied Jeremiah 29. We've studied you know, that, 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 that first part of, of that chapter of realizing that, w wait a minute, when my country is going under, there's still things that God wants me to do. He wants me to build houses. He wants me to make plans to move forward, but he wants to make sure that my hope is anchored in him and not the abilities of me being a self-made man. And those are two separate things. One is done by faith and by the power of God and the favor of God. The other is done by, by, by too much of a true grit, hard work, sweat. I'm going to do it. I'm going to break the wall. I'm going to get this done. One is pleasing to God and one is rejected by God. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by his spirit. And boy, maybe that's another lesson that you and I could just learn together here is, is learning to let God lead so that when we get to these particular crossroads or we get to a door before us, we can go, I have no idea how God's going to get this done. And then we can receive from him. Do you realize that the chairs that you're sitting in and in, 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 in this building that you're in or, or even this sanctuary that you're in, we had no idea how this was going to happen. And there are people in this room that's, that sat in the back room and walked through the crazy nonsense that was going on And out of nowhere, God made a way to the tune of more than $100,000 that you or I did not bring to the table. He made a way when it was completely impossible. And that's only one of so many stories about the craziness of letting God lead. God has done so much more than I could ever do in this place. Because it doesn't matter. Well, we got to give another giving message. We got to give this. Oh, we got to get. You know, really? <laughs> Good luck with that. No. We have to trust the Lord. We need to keep our hearts close to Him. We need to realize that God is the one that's going to do the work. It's not you or I. God does that work. But that's where it rubs right up against our pride and our faith. Because my human intellect tells me that I need to do X, Y, and Z. But then when I read through the scriptures, I see that, oh, wait a minute, no. Jesus says that the cure for this is I gotta seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. Okay, I got that intellectually. But practically, well, 
I may not get to that this week, or I may not get to that today. And we do everything else under the sun except for allow God to do the work. Can I tell you something that I'm, I'm learning in a new light, like right now in real time, like this week? I don't know. Maybe it could be something that could be a blessing to you as well. I don't know. But I know this, that earlier this week, I went and I, I sat in the park. I mentioned a little bit of this on Wednesday night. And I have a yellow pad. It's a small yellow pad. It's about like this size right here. It's in my pickup truck. In fact, if you see me at my pickup truck out front, I'll show you because it's right in my visor still. And I start writing all these things down. I was feeling discouraged. I was feeling depressed. I was feeling tired. I was feeling mentally and emotionally weak. And I wrote down on this piece of paper, who are you? And I started going down and I, I started listing out these particular struggles and so forth. And I lo- there was nobody around, so I had to get my thoughts out on paper is what it was. And I got to the end of this list and I'm sitting there, I got sunglasses on and I'm sitting in my truck and I just go, It wasn't a sigh of relief. It was like a sigh of disgust. And then God starts t- talking to me. Boom, 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 boom. You're a new creation in Christ. <laughs> and, and he begins to work me through a whole series of things. And over the course of the next 15, 20 minutes, I found new strength. I found new courage. And it wasn't anything that I did. But it came through everything that I laid down. God did the work. It was good. And what I have found over the course of time, and you probably find this to be the same thing, is that it's the words of, of, that we find in the scripture that allows you and I to see through the darkness. That God, when he whispers, it becomes light to my mind and to my emotions. And he's the one that lifts me out of the dark spot. You know this. Psalm 119, 105, right? His word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We understand that. You know that as you read the Psalms, what does it say in the Psalms? Oh, it's the entrance, or or, or rather, the entrance of your word is light, and it leads me into your presence. Oh, yes, goodness. We got to close because we are uh, at time here. He gets to the final verse here, and and, and, uh, 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 look, look, look to me for just a second, okay? <laughs> We've gone through some hot stuff right here. This is just incredibly, whew, goodness gracious. But we come to verse number 12, and we read the verse, and you go, James, are you feeling okay, buddy? We got to get you checked out for the virus or something. What is wrong with you, man? What? Look at verse number 12. James 5, verse 12, it says this. After all of this stuff, He says, but most of all, my brothers and sisters, never take an oath by heaven or earth or anything else, just a simple yes or no, so that you will not sin by, or so that you will not sin and be condemned. He gets through all of this. Look here, you rich people, weep and howl, go through some misery and suffer, you loser. You know, he says all of that, right? Oh, where's he going with this? Yes. And then he turns on verse, oh, dear brothers and sisters. And, you know, he starts moving. But, but verse 12, most of all, uh, most of all in this, um, don't take an oath. There it is. I hope that's encouraging to you. Oh, you want me to say something about it? Okay. Well, listen, it's a very simple thing. And the whole context comes together. In fact, the whole entire book comes together right on this. Hmm, how so? Well, listen, uh, think about this for just a second. It carries the idea of integrity. That's the idea. Well, let your yes be yes and your no be no. He, 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 all of this stuff about James talking about an authentic Christian relationship, you know, Christianity at the crossroads of culture, living out your faith in a world that's gone wild. All, right, that, that flavor. And, and he's taken us through five chapters now of, of saying, hey, this is what authentic Christianity looks like. Oh, you say you're a Christian? Well, then prove it, right? And all of this, he's gone through all of that stuff. I mean, he's been in our face since the opening chapters. And as he's getting down towards the end, he boils this thing down to about this oath thing, which is nothing more than carrying the idea of integrity. 
And the lesson for you and I, again, as it's poured out through the course of this epistle, is prove your faith. And in a powerful contrast, what does he do? Well, this, this contrast is against the people who do not have faith. And what he wants is the integrity to shine through. And may you and I stand out. Why? Because we have integrity. Because our words can be trusted. Not like the words at the early part of this chapter is the rich people that were hiring people, but they wasn't, wasn't paying them. Not like that. But they were keeping our word. Hey, I signed up at a church, so guess what does that mean? I'm going to be there. I'm not going to walk through this thing, no call, no show. I'm not going to get, you know, I made a commitment that I would do this for three months. I'm not going to get a month into it and say, ah, oh, peace out. I'm out of here. No, 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 no. You're, you're a person that can be counted upon. You're, you're, you're a man or a woman or a child or a youth of integrity. Your words can be trusted. And you're not taking advantage of people. And you're not pretending to be something that you're not. You're not a hypocritical person. Oh, yeah, Jesus put it this way. He says, watch out for the wolves in sheep's clothing. Did you catch that? Pretending to be something that you're not. That you're not walking in the back door. Well, I gotta put on my good Christian look now. I've got my little collar thing on, mask here now. I look good. How do, how do I look? Okay. Got a new flannel. Okay. Do I look okay? And then on the inside, a venomous snake. No, no. May the outside match the end. May the inside match the out. May we not be hypocritical people. May we not be somebody that is pretending. Final verse for you is this. Psalm, and don't turn in your Bible. Look on the screen instead. Psalm 141, verses 3 and 4. I'm going to leave you with this. Here's what it says. The psalmist, David, he says, Take control of what I say, O Lord, and guard my lips. Don't let me drift towards evil or take part in acts of wickedness. Don't let me share in the delicacies of those who do wrong. Did you see what David did? A guy after God's own heart is he rolled everything back upon the Lord. And that's what I want you to do here today. I want you to roll everything back upon the Lord. You know the shortfalls in your life. You know where you're in disobedience to the Lord. You know. You know where you're afraid to take a step. You know where you're depressed. You know where you're confused. You know where you're angry and frustrated. You know, you know, you know. And God, may I, may, may, may I say this, that, that the gospels tell us about Jesus, that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. His yoke, that wooden piece that goes around the neck of an ox that connects it to a partnering ox, the yoke. And that yoke is, they strap cords to it so it can pull a load behind them. Jesus said that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. When you're yoked up to Christ because you're a believer and you're walking in step with the Lord, it's easy. Didn't say it wasn't painful. Didn't say there's not going to be some, some nail-biting moments. But God is the one that is carrying the load. And for all of your pitfalls and failures, my encouragement to you is to roll it off on the Lord, to do what David did here in Psalm 141. May God be the one that watches the words that comes out of your mouth. May God be the one that keeps you from drifting into the stuff you shouldn't be in. And may God's Holy Spirit be the one that gives you the power for obedience. Amen? Let's stand to our feet here. Hey, what better message to celebrate the Christmas time than what Jesus has done? So at the end of the day, this is a Christmas message. And now, everybody that goes out of here today, you will have a sign. It says joy. <laughs> It's not a physical sign, but it's the direction of your mouth. Either it's going to be a brown or a smile. So go out and enjoy. May you smile. Listen, I, I know that 2020 has been a train wreck. <laughs> 2020 has scarred all of our souls. And even when we think, well, no, I'm doing just fine. Nope, 2020 has scarred us. Our lives have been changed without question. But James, man, <laughs> James teaches us as the church how to live 
in spite of loss. And that's what I want to encourage you guys with. That you would understand that though conditions are changing, God has not changed. Though the conditions are painful and uncertain, God has not changed. And he's absolutely certain. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that his love towards you is not going to fade. It's not going to end. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to abandon you. He's not going to leave you helpless. But you are called to something. You're called to obedience. Obey the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. And when you find like David, that those two things collide, may you do what David did here in Psalm 141, and you roll it off onto the Lord so God can carry the weight. And stop being afraid of the outcome and start living today, in the moment. Jesus said that tomorrow will take care of itself. Your obedience call is to today. Get right with Jesus. Thanks for joining us today. If you want to know more about having a real relationship with God, click the Do You Know Him link at westminstercalvary.org. We invite you to join us for our regular worship services on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. and Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. We are conveniently located on the northeast corner of Wadsworth Parkway and Church Ranch Boulevard in the Stanley Lake Marketplace Shopping Center. For more information, please contact our church offices at 303-223-4640. Thanks and God bless.